Hello, and welcome back to Dave's American Flyer Trains for the continuance of the rebuild of 26742 remote control switch and a dual controller that not only controls this switch, but the matching left-hand switch, which we will not do in this video, and we'll get started. Off camera, I'm going to do some things that uh, I want to take up your valuable time to watch, and that's simply going to be to unbind this wire, start uh, examining it inch by inch, uh, I'm also going to probably put new tips on these wires simply by cleaning them off. And of course, there's there's a yellow rainbow, or excuse me, rainbow wires, one for each switch of the pair. I'm then going to remove the four screws that are in the bottom of the controller. This one only has three, but usually they'll have four. There's one missing there. And remove this cover. Now this cover pops off. Another way you can get it out is simply to give a gentle pressure down on these levers. Uh, and it will drop this plate out, and with that will come, the bulbs will come out, these levers will drop through those slots, and then you'll have this cover free for cleaning. So we'll set that aside. I'm going to do that off camera. Also off camera, I'm going to inspect these power wires and probably go ahead and give them fresh tips as well. On this right-hand switch, I'm going to remove the two screws that hold on the top of the uh, terminal block, and that will allow me to remove this terminal block. Uh, just be careful that the lenses on each side are uh, in there firmly so that you don't lose those. I'm going to remove the terminal nuts off the post. And there's nothing else really to do on this side. This I don't usually take off, the, the uh, two train operation button. Then off camera, I'll take off these back plane pieces uh, that are on the bottom of the switch. Uh, and these, I believe, these being this pair of switches, have never been maintained for the simple reason that they have all of their screws. I rarely, if ever, find them that have all their screws. I have found them with none, one, two, but this plane or plate has five, this plate has its three, this plate has two. Now, it's got a position for four, but I've never seen these come any other way but with two. And I'm going to simply remove these five which are little short screws that go into the Bakelite plastic. These three, same thing. I'll just drop off these two pieces of sheet metal. Dropping, loosening these two and taking them out will allow the solenoid to be pulled out. And then we can begin to work uh, on the bottom and taking a look at the bottom as well. But uh, I'll do that all off camera to save time. Let's start with the dual controller by removing three screws on the bottom uh, plate for the controller, I was able to free the interior part of the controller from the cover. And of course the cover now can be simply washed, clean, conditioned with CRC226, whatever you prefer. Set that aside. And this is what the inside of the controller looks like. A little complicated mess of switches and wires, uh, but it's uh, pretty simple in the way it works. First, uh, I, I inspected the wiring on either end and I went ahead and snipped off the old exposed wire on both the power connector and both of the rainbow multicolor wires. Uh, and I'll begin an inspection that will go the full length of the wires, uh, including washing them. If I find a break in the wire, I'll do that repair with just regular shrink wrap, heated shrink wrap to tighten it back up so that there's no exposed wiring or if there's a break, it's repaired. So this one only has what looks like is this household lint or dust. I don't see any rust. Uh, I don't see any um, cocoons, although I've found just about everything you can imagine will in these things. Mostly of it is, is uh, hair, dust, lint, uh, things like that, and maybe some moisture damage uh, at times. But they're pretty simple little operations that have a lot of multiple contact points. For example, if we take this front lever, you'll notice that it initially only rocks and affects those two contact points there and there. And what that does is, is when it goes this way, fully extended, it touches that contact point there, but doesn't stay connected to it. And that is what shifts the current in the solenoid to send it in the opposite direction to move the frog. Likewise, when it comes down in this direction, it temporarily touches right there and, free, and sends it in the other direction. Now the other side over here illuminates the bulb based upon the last thing that you did. For example, 
Uh, right now, the bulb connection, which is that part of the lever right there, is not touching right there to go into the bulb. <clears throat> but if I were to place it over here, this touches there, changes the direction of the solenoid, and leaves that portion of the lever down to connect the green bulb. And of course, you can put these in neutral, in which neither bulb is illuminated. And what I look for is just ease of movement and very clean connection points. Now, that is not a connection point right there, although I will clean it. That is simply a spring which holds a portion of this in place to continue to have the bulb illuminated. But I'll clean all these contact points, whether they're temporary or permanent. Now it's a little difficult sometimes, a little challenging to get down in there with a rotary tool, but it's not impossible. On this one, I'm simply going to remove the bulbs, start with removing the bulbs with the intention of not replacing them permanently, but replacing them with translucent bulbs. And boy, these are firm in there. So it's a good thing we're going to remove these and clean the base of the bulb if we choose to reuse these and also clean the base right there as well. Take all those out and I'm actually going to wash it. And yeah, you can wash these. I've done it plenty of times. You don't want to submerge it. You don't want to soak it, but you can certainly wash it with say a toothbrush or other soft brush with soap uh, just that same soap that I use uh, on the trains and wash it, shake it off really well, and then let it dry. I would not submerge it or soak this piece, but it seems to be pretty resilient, and I'll wash this. Now, there's no moving parts on this. This is just the connection pattern, so nothing to do there. But um, as far as polishing, uh, except I usually leave it alone, but I am going to polish the connection points and wash this thoroughly and then rinse and hang it up. I'm also going to wash the wire uh, and then make sure it's in good condition by a complete visual inspection. On the switch itself, I've removed the back plane or bottom plates uh, that are nothing more than tin uh, and examined them. Again, I found, uh, historically, I found a lot of stuff on these, whether it be cocoon pieces or a lot of dent rust. This one only has one patch of external rust that I found. I don't find anything internally that's significant. Probably the only thing I'll do on these is washing and then a very, very light coat cleaning with very, very fine steel wool. Uh, I don't intend to try to remove any of these fingerprint stains. Uh, there's really no need to do that. Prior to reassembly, I probably will put a very light coat of 3-in-1 on here just for preservation purposes. And this is the plane that came off right here, covers that area. And this is what the interior of the switch looks like at the bottom. Most of them have a date stamp. This one was made in March 1957. And they have varying different sizes and um, types of stamps. I think some of them even have the month name, like MAR57, something like that. But it's kind of interesting to see when they're made. This is the slide switch that activates both tracks as being controllable simultaneously by one transformer. And therefore, the switch is open right now. So it's in the uh, two-train operation. And that is, they're independent. Slide it back. And the outside, uh, both the rails are connected and will operate simultaneously. And these, of course, are simply the connections for the inside and outside. This is the solenoid mechanism underneath this. Now, I didn't want to take it out because I wanted to show you how it works and what I'm going to clean. Notice how badly corroded these contact points are. Look how black they are. And this is very uh, uh, not unusual. This is usually typical, very typical of what I find on these. This is the screw that goes into the frog that you see the tip of on the other end. Once we release this and the two screws that hold the solenoid mechanism in, this can be wiggled out. As soon as it's wiggled out, this little throw right here is going to become free and it's going to shoot out this way because that's where the spring pressure is. So when you take this off, you're going to release the spring. So it's a little tricky to get back on because you've got to hold the spring and the throw at the same time, get it back on there, and push it back in. I usually do not release this hex nut right here unless there's a real good reason to do so for cleaning because this is what allows you to adjust the throw for strength. And I figured if it worked once, why, why change it? 
I will polish all these contact points, including the opposite side of this uh, spring contact right here and all these contact points. Look how black that one is. So those will all be clean. Now, yes, I'm going to wash this top to bottom. And when I wash it, the solenoid will be kind of like swinging free on these wires. There's enough strength to hold it. And I'll just wrap it in a little bag, plastic bag, put a rubber band around it. I don't wash it. I don't submerge it, but I will clean it. And you'll see how the rest of it looks on the inside. It'll be released when that screw and that screw are released. And of course, here's your four contact points. Now, I don't know how these are exactly mapped, but of course, there's one for red, green, blue, and yellow. Excuse me, red, green, black, and yellow. Uh, black is base, yellow is the bulb, and then the green and red contact points are what simply shift the direction of the current flow uh, on the solenoid to reposition the track. Now, this is what it looks like when it's operating. Let me grab the other side of this. Notice how the contacts change position. And then it's the responsibility of that throw and its spring pressure to hold the frog in place and not let it move when trains pass on, when trains pass and put pressure on it. And that's what takes, might take some adjustment. Now I've had these that are very, very sticky. Uh, and I have lightly cleaned these, washed, lightly polished. Sometimes I will put a very, very light lubrication around that point and on the throw but usually that's not necessary. You just will not know until you get it back together again whether or not uh, you it is, it is uh, mobile enough to allow the power to move it and the solenoid to move it, or is it going to require a little assistance. Just remember that if you put some assistance in there with lubrication, you might be freeing up the frog to move on its own. I usually tighten this screw down until it stops, although this will allow you to change uh, the position of the frog. Notice that this position, the frog, is very flat and in the same plane as the rail head. And this is how I usually examine it, is from this position. And of course I will take those nuts off and clean the post. And next I'm going to take the uh, top of the signal block off. But this one has no concave apparent characteristics to it. It's a very smooth transition between the frog and the track. So this one ought to be a very, very good switch. I don't see any warping in the Bakelite plastic or any anomalies in the rail head. Look how flat that is. They all seem to be in the same plane. So let's continue the disassembly. I removed the two screws holding the signal block top on and that freed the signal block to come off and this is what it looks like. Pretty simple little mechanism. It does have two plastic lenses and you just want to make sure those are in place. I'll wash this, cleaning up the lenses as well. The bulb appears to be burned out because it's blackened but I'll be replacing it with a 24 bolt and it's easy, usually easily removed but Based on those other two bulbs, it's pretty sticky, so I won't do that uh, online. And then what creates the coloration when it shifts back and forth are those pieces of paper or plastic. And of course, when it shifts back and forth, the solenoid moves and it changes it from red to green. That's all it is. Should you find that these are falling off or you've damaged them during the rebuild process, they are available from Portline Hobbies. I just replaced several of mine. Uh, I believe the ones I got from uh, Portline Hobbies just have an adhesive right in the middle. You simply cut them to the length you want them because you want them covering both sides. That's what I prefer, just like the came from the manufacturer. A little bit of adhesive here, you simply tuck them down and they're good to go. But it's not unusual that I find these with a disassembly that they're just dried up and they just come off way too easily. They'll just flake off. So that's the top of the solenoid. I continued the disassembly by removing the screw that goes into the back or the bottom of the frog. The two screws that hold the small plate on, which holds the, thro the throw and the spring, and there's the spring that applies the tension, uh, which 
supposedly is calibrated enough to hold the or prevent the trains from moving the frog. And then this is the bottom, and we're going to pull this out. It's a little tricky, but it, it works. And I'll pull that out and show you the solenoid. So the spring and the throw fell out. And the spring, I, I uh, usually measure these. I don't know that there's any good length, but I measure them so that if I retension them, I don't over-tension them. I try to do maybe an, uh, an eighth of an inch or less of retensioning by pulling on it. There's the throw. Some will have a very pointed edge. Others will be smooth like this one. I only clean these. I don't, try, I don't like lubricating them. And then there is the solenoid. And here is the plunger and the arm. I'll clean the top contacts here. You can see how black they are. And then using my usual process, I'm going to thoroughly polish this plunger in the solenoid that's used in the solenoid. Now, fortunately, the plunger is not attached rigidly to this arm. This is what allows you to pull this lever out because you're going to have to slide it underneath that slot right there. And get it out but it's fairly easy to reinsert and reconnect like that it just takes a little finagling I mean after all it was a symbol like that so they're made to get apart now I'm not going to take this off because it was looks like it's pretty much centered at the factory and there's really is no reason but it is going to go a wash and this is going to be polished in the interior of that solenoid thoroughly cleaned I found that cleaning solenoids not lubricating what makes them have better performance. And again, I will simply take this, put it in a plastic bag, wrap a rubber band around it, and then that's how I will do the washing of the base and the track that begin that process. Uh, and then eventually I will slide this back in temporarily and do the railhead, clean the top of the railhead. Now this one I'll probably use uh, a Scotch-Brite or maybe even a really, really, really fine grit sandpaper sponge to clean. Uh, although it's not recommended to scratch railhead, um, I do clean it with that. And then, of course, I'll end up, of course, i got to bend that pin back. Uh, I'll end up uh, polishing that with a rotary tool as well. We'll see what it looks like. But it is going to get thoroughly washed and then reconditioned with CRC-226. I will also thoroughly, oops, I'll also thoroughly polish uh, those posts uh, for the terminals. Uh, and make sure that they're in good condition. Now, I have found some of these terminal nuts to be on here so badly and corroded so badly, I cannot get them off, could not get them off. When that has happened, I ended up separating the wire here and then sending a new wire down to connect to it rather than trying to use that post. I've just not had good experience when that's been severed, or excuse me, when it's bound tightly. And this is as far as I break them down. And you can hear that paper crackling just a little bit. So I'm going to treat it gingerly. I'm going to go ahead and put a plastic bag around it because I want to try to protect that paper. Uh, and it, sometimes it just flakes and falls apart the first time you touch it uh, just due to age. But again, they're easily replaceable. They can be ordered and replaced. All contact points will be polished. Uh, moving parts will be thoroughly cleaned. Maybe some lubrication. And then the rest of it is reassembly. And that includes, don't forget, uh, the plunger. I'm going to thoroughly, thoroughly polish that. But we'll take a look at before and after. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up as disassembly of a 26742 remote control switch. Thanks again for watching Dave's American Flyer Trains. So long, everyone.